Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to. So, so wait um, a minute. So wait a minute. Wait okay. A minute. I think Dr. Anand's going to come and be a moderator, or you can. Yeah. I can. I can introduce all the chairs. I mean, chairpersons, co-chair, and convener. All right, and then I'll. I'll call the first speaker, Dr. Atu. All right. Uh, now start. We are online. Hello. 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 Good morning. Uh, sir, uh, now, uh, now you can start. Hi, Dr. Anna. Hi. hi, hi, hi. Hi, good morning. Hi, Dr. Paisen. Hi, Dr. Hi, hi. Hi. Good morning, Jimmy. Good morning, good morning Dr. Tosa. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Sir. Mangat. Hi. Hi, Jimmy. Hi. Morning. Morning. So, so I was there gonna, to uh, another platform. <laughs> I was just. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Platforms, actually. So, yeah. So, you're going to call, yeah. I mean, announce all the. Chairpersons yeah, and moderators, yeah, right. You can yeah. Uh, uh, start up. So I think we are uh, uh, from virtual MNC team. Are we live? Yes, it's already it is. So can we start the session? Virtual MNC is somebody there? Yeah, they already yes. said that it is live. Okay. Yes, okay. sir. Yes, sir. You can start, sir. Yes, yes. Then, uh, Doctor Paisan, I think you can get things rolling. Yeah. Okay. Um. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the um, AIOS, Asia Pacific Virtual Neural Society Symposium on updates on AMD and PCB. It's a pleasure to organize this symposium with all of you. Well, I um, may introduce the chairpersons of this session, Dr. Timothy Lai from Hong Kong and Dr. Atul Kumar from India. Another co-chairperson is Dr. Andrew Chang from Australia and convener is Dr. Uh, Mangat Dokra from India. And I'm Dr. Paisan from Thailand and Dr. Anand Rachandran from India is going to be moderators. May I call the first speaker of today's session, Dr. Atu Kumar from India. He's going to speak about um, pachycoral disease and enigma. Please, um, Dr. Atu. So good morning, friends from all over the uh, from all over the east. Actually, we are part, also part of the east, and uh, we are uh, you all know each other. And uh, so I'm from India, and I'm from the I'm also heading the Doctor uh, Center of Ophthalmic Sciences, which is the apex of Ophthalmic Center for the Government of India for the National Program for Control of Blindness. You also happen to be the collaborating center for prevention of blindness. Uh, Southeast Asia, and we have a number of countries from Southeast Asia who are with us, and so we also get to meet them WHO, and 
the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, where we are housed, is a premier ophthalmic institution. We offer research for residency training as also for good clinical work, and it's renowned all over the world for this. Uh, this place is renowned all over the world. So I've been here for the last since I joined as a MD student, and I've devoted my life for this cause of uh, treating as well as controlling as well as preventing retinal blindness in my part of the country and uh, in India. And so I'd like to just share of these, this talk, which I have from my institution. And uh, these are my, some of my thoughts, which I'd like to share. It's the first time I think I get this opportunity, which I'd like to thank the AIOS and Professor Namta Sharma, Professor Nam, uh, my Namta for having given me this opportunity, rare opportunity to get to speak to you all about what I think. Uh, so, pachycoroid disease is a enigma, I feel, because it's got macular, it's a group of macular diseases which manifest similar choroidal findings. So, we've got diseases affect the choroid, like the Vokainagi Harada syndrome, but those are different, though, inflammatory diseases. So, this is something unique that it has uh, four entities with it, and often we see this pachycoroid pigment epithelopathy, which is a form of fraste of a uh, Central serous choroid retinopathy, which we all know, which is very common in India and my part of the country. And I get to stop central serous choroid retinopathy. And then we have pachycoroid neovascularopathy, which is only pure neovascularization, but you may be having pachycoroid with it. And I'll tell you what is pachycoroid. And of course, the most commonest entity which we'll be talking about today and the most dreaded of all is the pachycoroid, uh, pachycoroid choroidal vasculopathy. So this is, these are the four entities which encompass this clinical spectrum. And this is it's called pachycoroid disease. So when we call it pachycoroid disease, and very interestingly, unlike AMD, uh, it cannot be a factor. You don't have it in the old age. It's depending on what age we get. And in, 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 the, in the my practice at the AIMS, or the RP Center of Sarmic Sciences, which is part of AIMS, so in short, I'll say the all instrument aims. Uh, we have these patients who have typically a uh, hyper anxiety, stressful personalities. They suffer from emotional stress. They suffer from lack of sleep. The kind of people we see with pachycoroid disease and uh, of you have tobacco use or taking corticosteroids and to get together to understand these various diseases which are so common to all of us. It's there in Singapore, it's there in China, Japan, and uh, so many other uh, Malaysia are affected, and so are we. And it's over 50% of my patients, OCTA and the more of resurgence of use of the ICG, I found we're picking up this disease more commonly. We're also looking at the choroid more keenly with the OCT angiography. And so we've been seeing these kind of patients and we see them a little less older patients. So a very important hypothesis which has been given is that by uh, <clears throat> Bailey Fruin, which who says that there's a multitude of uh, pathogenesis actually. All we know is it basically causes packy vessels which are dilated, engorged, packed with blood, congested vessels, which are there, more of the outer blood vessels of the choroid are congested. So it's not actually thickening of the vessel, but it's congestion of the vessel. So these congested, dilated vessels are called packy vessels. There's also the heart ability response forms on the ICG and the, the vessels tend to leak, die, uh, usually and especially the endocoroidal vessels. There is also, as Bailey Freud says, this venous collateral.
I think Dr. Atul is muted. Yeah. Dr. You Atul are muted. muted. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you are muted. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 good, yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, it works now. Yeah, I can hear you, people. Yeah, we can hear you in uh, batches. Uh... Yeah, now it's okay. But... So uh, it looks like we've lost Dr. Atul's uh, screen now. Atul sir's net is not working properly, sir. So, Harshit, uh, what do you think uh, is the issue? Yeah, I think we are. Can you hear me? So, yes, yes. It's a are. net yeah. issue, sir. Internet issue. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it's, okay. now it's okay. So, it's okay now? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Very yeah. yeah. clear. Please proceed. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So yes. you get increase in the thickness of the choroid, which is because of the congested vessels. And you get these strange trucin, which are large in size, greater than 124 microns. And they're spread, spread as cluster or scattered. So around the posterior pole, and they may be there all over around the posterior pole. They're called pachydrusin, like pachy vessels, pachydrusin, increase choroidal congestion and some congestion uh, ischemia because of the narrowing of the satellites and the chorocapillaries. So, as Bailey Fruent says in his recent uh, article that he, there's some choroidal venous insufficiency, he says, but uh, this choroidal venous insufficiency is a thought which was proposed by Yanozi and then passed on. And so, the choroidal venous insufficiency may lead to choroidal, uh, uh, you know, venous collaterals and venous collaterals, sort of congestion in the veins. This congestion in the veins leads to thickened vessels, thickened choroid. So it can occur in any kind of vacuum disease can occur in any kind of choroid thickness. The multimodal imaging shows attenuated inner layers. So the inner layers are kind of mechanically compressed as well as ischemic. They are ischemic and compressed by the dilated halas layer, which are the pachy vessels. And so one part of this entity of pachychoroid disease is the most commonly seen, which is more uh, causing blindness besides CSC is the pachychoroid uh, choroidal vasculopathy and is characterized by type 1 that is between the RP and the Brooks membrane. You have uh, the type 1 new vasculopathy with aneurysms. I know these uh, terminology which I'm using. So the pachychoroid epithelopathy is a form fraster of uh, settled serous choroidopathy where you have these pigmentary deposits but no cl classic evidence of uh, uh, new or just food or a pigment. There's a pigmentary abnormality in the AF on the color picture. And if you see the OCT, also uh, there is a thickening, a thickened or dilated vessels, but the retina seems to be normal. So then comes to the central serous chorotopathy where you have these blister like lesion at the posterior pole, often younger patients. As I said, they are hyper stress, anxiety, which is so prevalent in our country, also like many other countries, probably. But we I get to see a lot of these patients of CSC and you always look at the choroid is showing thickened choroid, uh, larger thickened vessels because of the congestion. And you can see some smokestack leak over there. So this is a patient who was unfortunately given intravenous methylprednisolone thinking it was Vokoanagi Harada because as I said, these inflammatory disorders like VKH or Vokoanagi Harada may have a thickened choroid and uh, they may uh, mimic 
and so people may give by uh, an error give uh, steroids which are actually contraindicated for patients of central serous chorioidopathy and central serous chorioidopathy is a part of the pancreatic spectrum so steroids are contraindicated so this patient had huge leaks with fibrin deposit and there was a pigment epithelial rash with a lot of uh, serous fluid which stopped and after uh, discontinuing the steroid intravenous now ocd i give a lot of importance to it and you can see the branching vascular network i I feel that the treatment of poly polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy is to a great extent dependent now. I feel that it's dependent on the OCTA picture because I've seen patients of pachycardial uh, choroidal vasculopathy actually bleeding if on the basis of OCT only if there's no fluid and there's no presence of uh, active disease. But if the OCTA shows me a large vascular network, I would like to treat. This is a type one, which is in the between the rp and the brooks so you can see the double layer sign which is there the type 1 neovascularization and the large choroidal vessels which are abutting onto the degenerating rp so polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy which is the most important of all the four entities which are there under the pachycardial disease spectrum has a predilection for the asian ancestry what i like to tell my uh, co colleagues and my uh, friends from the far east that we also happen to be in the same territory as you are and we get i get to see a lot of these uh, pachycardial disease uh, patients maybe more than 50% and uh, we published data in our indian news uh, journals as well as we have some data abroad also so we've seen it as a standalone thing an entity or as a uh, variant of a new vascular amd in a younger age group they this variant probably having thick choroids irregular pds and often we see patients of chronic csc going into a stage of polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy and so all patients of csc have a octa definitely done because i find the octa or the angio oct really helps me to see the new vessels very clearly unlike the icg so i see this uh, uh, bunch of polyps or aneurysm aneurysm as they call it along with the new vascular branching vascular network and you can see this multiple sharp pds or are they uh, bifid or notched pds with the uh, thumb like pd or sharp pds these are very characteristic of a branching vascular network with the large dilated vessels normally the thickness is less than 300 if it's more than 300 micron we take it as pachycardial disease so this is one of our articles which was published in 2019 and this is another patient we do get to see a lot of bleeding in our patients in my center and i like to then use sub which i'll go to here right now at the end of this one of the talks I look forward to it i look forward to jimmy chewing stock also on the non uh, injury non icg features i look forward to timothy lies stock so i inject about 12.5 micrograms in 0.1 ml tpa i give about less than 50 micrograms total and i injected with the vastin along with the air and i injected into the sub with a 41 gauge transfusion needle i put the cocktail inside and uh, talking about here and i as i told you again that i i have started giving a lot of importance in the last one year to oct angiography or angio oct for the follow up patients of pcv and uh, this patients tend to do better than us could md they are younger age definitely they have a tendency to develop polyps they have a thicker choroid than neovascular amd classic in seen in caucasians they probably require a lesser number of injections but they definitely do require photodynamic therapy if they are not responding and visual acuity is probably doing better if they get injected as and when required so for photodynamic therapy unfortunately it's not available to die right now in india i think novartis has sold the rights to some other company and we still waiting for the die i'd like to know what's the situation of far east so we see this uh, polyp disappearing after treatment and uh, patients responding very well so i reuse reduced films or half fluent speedity so this is just a video showing the patient who bled how we treated in, in my, my uh, how do i treat it so i just want to show this of course you got to talk on this but this is just to tell you this is a bleed which involved the fovea so once it's involved the fovea is going to destroy the photoreceptors and lead to irreversible visual loss so i like to put a little uh, tramsulone and uh, induce pvd because before you until you induce the pvd this we can't do the surgery and then with iost guided i like to first identify the area which is not the subretinal space which is 
benefit of any PD, and so I put the forty one gauge self sealing red top me, and inject this TPA Vastin air cocktail, and those patients do extremely well, and that's all I'd like to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Atul, for a fantastic overview of uh, pachycoroid. Uh, it sets the stage perfectly for this session. I think uh, this is a very enlightening talk. And uh, just to get things out, I just like to uh, ask a couple of questions. Like, first of all, do you increasingly rely largely on swept source OCT rather than SD OCT images? Because I think some of the images were SD OCT and pretty good images also. So you mentioned that you like to treat patients increasingly with. Uh, so I we, we use both the. Yeah, please proceed. So, the, the, so I, I use more of the swept source OCT from Topcon, and uh, I find that gives me the entire vitreoretinal interface till the choroid very well in the same scan, scan image. So that gives me the exact thickness of the choroid as well as the changes in the choroid. And it also tells me the retina subretinal status. And I use that with the on OCTA, which is about three millimeter resolution, gives me a good resolution, three or 4.5 millimeter resolution. And the top con OCTA is still, I feel, uh, quite standardized. And I can pick up the new vessels even if they're tiny. And many of these CSC patients actually have uh, early new vascular membranes and then we inject. So I feel this disease has so much of overlap that you cannot ignore a patient with CSC, especially once they cross three or four months. I like to always get their OCTA and pay being a non-invasive test, it's definitely beneficial and ICGA may not give you much information in early new vascular membrane, new vascular membranes and though I feel the OCT, OCT angiography has a big role. Yeah, I have another interesting question and uh, this will probably be more directed to Dr. Timothy and Dr. Jimmy, if you can come in. So I've often noticed that in high myopes, it's difficult to characterize pachycoroid. And I know in your populations in Hong Kong and Singapore, you see a lot of uh, you know high myopes. So in the setting of a high myope, where the choroid typically is very thin, how do you then gauge uh, pachycoroids? Because I have also seen in certain high myopes. In fact, last month I was treating a high myope with what looked like a, a PCB uh, lesion, and it could even have been a myopic CMEM. It's a little difficult to characterize that. So would you suggest that perhaps going forward we should have a Axial length or refractive error, uh, you know, normogram for choroid, you know, because uh, the, you, you must be seeing a lot of thin choroid. So sometimes you have this PCV popping up in a setting of a thin choroid or leptochoroid as it's, you know, considered. So what are your thoughts on that? Because I'm sure you're seeing a lot of those patients more than what we see. So Dr. Timothy, would you like to go with that? Okay, I was going to say ladies first. So uh, I'll, I'll come in first. Um, so uh, we do see a lot of uh, patients with high myop here. And um, um, to, uh, to be honest, a pachycora in these patients are not that uh, common. Most of the time, uh, they do not develop uh, lesions like PCV and CSC, although some of them might develop some, uh, the lesions at the edge of the um, staphyloma, which is actually the site of a localized congestion of the uh, choroidal vessel. So um, we don't usually use the um, uh, quant uh, quantitative um, measure for the uh, thickness. So uh, you can't just have a cutoff like uh, 250 micron or 300 micron. So it's actually more important to look at the morphology um, on the uh, OCT or on the ICG angiography to look at the um, vessels, the individual vessels to see if uh, uh, there are any pecky vessels, which are the thickened vessels. So maybe Jamie can actually comment more on the OCTA findings because she's the queen in OCTA. Sure. <laughs> Not really. I just want to uh, fully agree with you. Um, and uh, more often we see um, polypoidal lesions appearing uh, in the context of a um, edge of a staphyloma or tilted disc syndrome in these um, funny, funny shaped eyes, let's put it that way. Uh, and in keeping with that, that uh, mechanism, uh, we also see localized congestion rather than a widespread 
thickening phenomenon, for example, in, uh, in dome-shaped macula. So I think there is also a, a kind of disturbance in the choroid, but uh, the mechanism is probably different. Um, uh, uh, we've seen uh, uh, a case uh, shown by Kyoko Onomatsu, who is the queen of myopia, as we all know. Um, very, very interesting case showing a VKH, which is really uncommon uh, in a patient who happened to be high myo. And, uh, and at first, uh, the, the, I think the presentation choroid was maybe about 200 microns, which is relatively normal, as you mentioned, in terms of qu quantitative measures. But as this patient undergoes uh, steroid treatment, uh, we could see that the cora goes back to much thinner, maybe about 100 micron, which is really what we expect to be normal for someone who is maybe uh, minus 10 diopter. So that is um, just um, something to look out for, as you mentioned very rightly, Anna. Um, a 200 micron um, choroid could be normal, could be abnormal. Yeah, so that, that, that's an interesting thing because in your Eastern populations, you have a high incidence of myopia and therefore intuitively thinner choroids. But you also have a very high incidence of PCV. So both seem to fly in the face of each other. And based on that, would you say that myopia has no protective effect or has no effect bearing on the incidence of pachychoroid and vis-a-vis -vis PCV? Would you say that? Well, I would say that actually uh, myopia has some protective effect because uh, if you do some population studies, you can actually see that most of the patient with uh, PCV or with uh, central serous retinopathy, they, uh, their refractive error would be in the plus, uh, uh, would be more hyperopic rather than myopic. But uh, we do get some low myops with, um, with um, these uh, findings, but in high myopia is not common. So high myopia, we would define it as probably six to eight diopters or more. Yeah. So, oh. uh, yeah, sure. May, may I ask a question to Dr. Atu? Yeah, yeah, please Dr. Atu. Yeah. Why, why do you mix the avastin and TPA together and in chain two subretina? What's the reason? TP, of course, liquefies the clot, but vaccine kind of regresses the new vessels which have bled. So it gives a protective effect for some weeks. So, so I, like, I like to give double the dose of vaccine, 0.1 milligram, so 0 0.05 ml, so I give 0.1 ml. So this way the vaccine helps to regress, uh, shrink those new vessels which are bleeding for some time. And of I course, see. we've got to continue the anti of injections subsequently and uh, follow the patient up as a pure PCV patient or because these are mostly PCV eyes which bleed. It's unlike the AMD a disease where we don't have these aneurysmal dilatations. So they tend to bleed a lot. And I've seen many of these ble bleeding patients, you know, and I found that even when there's no subretinal fluid, if the OCT angiography shows a large membrane, then uh, on my top con machine, then I'd like to give an anti of injection. Okay. Irrespective of the OCT findings. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. A very uh, absorbing discussion. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Andrew Chang from Australia. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure thank to have you. Yeah. Thank you. So, good morning, we, Andrew. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. We move so to uh, Dr. Timothy Lang, yeah, uh, who's uh, professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, uh, Doyen in the Asia Pacific sector, won numerous boards. He is the director of the 2010 Retan Macular Center, Hong Kong. And it's my great pleasure to invite you uh, to uh, give us this talk on uh, uh, ICU. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Timothy Lai. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, AILS to, uh, to organize for organizing this um, symposium together with APVRS. So let me share my screen. Right, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, non-ICJ diagnostic criteria for uh, PCV. So these are my disclosures. 
So if, as you've heard from uh, the wonderful talk uh, earlier by uh, Dr. Tu, um, PCV is uh, quite prevalent in uh, our Asian population. So it accounts for about um, 20 uh, to up to 40% of patients presenting as neovascular AMD. And it is characterized by multiple recurrent episodes of um, serous or hemorrhagic PED. And also uh, it's um, due to these abnormal um, aneurysmal lesion you see in uh, ICG angiography. So uh, the most commonly used diagnostic criteria that we um, use for PCV is uh, the Everest criteria. So this is mainly used in the um, clinical trials. So uh, this, uh, the Everest study, as you know, is the first multi-centered randomized controlled trial for treatment on PCV. And, um, and the PCV is diagnosed based in the central reading center grading of uh, various features on the cons focal scanning laser or thermoscope based ICGA. So you see the uh, presence of focal ICGA hyperfluorescence within the first six minutes uh, after the ICG injection. And then um, with one of these features, including the branching vesicle network, pulsatile polyp, nodule appearance when viewed stereoscopically, presence of hypofluorescent halo, uh, orange sub retinal nodule on color photograph, and association with massive submacular hemorrhage. So these are just some examples of the uh, uh, lesions on ICGA. So you can see this patient uh, has uh, uh, multiple polypoidal lesions together with a branching vesicle network. And in this case, uh, you can see also this patient has a, a notch PED with um, polypoidal lesion on the edge. And sometimes these lesions can occur in multiple like a bunch of grapes. So uh, although ICGA is still the uh, standard um, uh, gold standard in di diagnosis of PCV, but uh, we can also diagnose PCV without the use of ICG in many cases uh, based on fundus appearance of OCT uh, findings as well. Uh, this is because uh, in many places, RCGA might not be available. So uh, if you look at the fundus appearance, so you can see the multiple recurrent um, uh, PEDs, uh, subretinal uh, nodule, the orange nodule, and also you can see usually there are minimal soft truisms like you see in typical neovascular AMD. And uh, we also uh, recently uh, uh, caused some of the uh, Drusen called them pachydrusen because these are oxidated with um, the thick choroid. And uh, you can also see massive retinal uh, or sub uh, retinal bleeds. So here are some fundus appearance. So in this patient's uh, left eye, you can see already some disiform scar formed. And in the uh, right eye, you can see this patient has a polypoidal lesion with some surrounding heart exudate and um, a few pachydrusen. So in uh, one of the paper published uh, from Thailand uh, from uh, Dr. Verapon, uh, the group um, uh, described some of the features quite nicely in this JAMA ophthalmology paper. So here you can see th uh, these are the uh, orange uh, nodules. Um, another feature that is suggestive of PCV is a massive subretinal hemorrhage, uh, a notch uh, PED or hemorrhagic PED. And uh, so you can actually combine these findings with the OCT. Um, so OCT, in terms of OCT, we have to use at least a um, spectral domain OCT. And now we also have our swap source OCT because this, these uh, OCT can have better uh, resolution as well as better penetration uh, through the RPE for visualization of the choroid. So the polyps sometimes can appear as a uh, dome-shaped elevation in the RPE layer. And also you can see the BVN as a double layer sign. So the, these are two reflective layers on the RPE surface. And um, you can also see that uh, in some of the younger patients, uh, the patient will have a thick choroid as well as mentioned in the previous talk. So some of the SDOCT features suggestive of PCV include a sharp peak, thumb-like notch, or M-shaped PED, hyperreflective ring beneath the PED, um, double layer sign um, with the thin separation between the RPE and Brooks membrane, pachychoroid, so a thickened choroid here. Um, some people will consider about 300 microns plus, and also on fast OCT, you see the RPE rings. 
Uh, this is again taken from the paper from uh, Veropon. And you can see that um, how they define a sharp peak PED. So anything uh, above 70% uh, uh, angle, they consider is as a sharp peak PED. So on the top, um, you can see the typical neovascular AMD kind of PED. So the uh, PED is not uh, having a very acute angle. Whereas in the bottom, you see the PCV, PED lesions, and these are very, very sharp peak PED. You also sometimes see multiple and uh, multi nobulated uh, double humped uh, PEDs. And also uh, here you can see the double layer sign uh, with the notch PED. So combining these uh, fundus photograph and SDOTD features, um, they found uh, the uh, uh, diagnostic feature is pretty good. So uh, around about uh, 0.93 um, in the AUC and uh, when two of these signs are present. So you also have enhanced depth imaging, which can uh, in the spect uh, spectral domain OCT to visualize the deeper choroidal layer. And we found that uh, PCV patient and CSC patients, we usually have thicker choroid. So it um, might be one of the indicator for um, uh, PCV. On fast is also useful, so you can use the, uh, the on fast OCT to look at the uh, picky uh, vessels as well as the RPA elevation. So these uh, could be included in some of the non ICGA diagnostic method. So with all these uh, tools available, so um, a group of us, uh, so led by uh, Jamie and Moonki and myself, so we formed this um, APOIS PCV workgroup. Uh, we will try to get some uh, OCT ba based or non uh, ICGA based uh, diagnosis of PCV. So we actually uh, formed this uh, committee and then we had um, two uh, meetings. Uh, so one uh, meeting, firstly, the stage one is the consensus meeting to shortlist some of the criteria. And second stage is to evaluate uh, which features and you, we use some um, sets from uh, both Singapore and Milan. And our findings were published in uh, ophthalmology uh, last year. And so you can see that we also developed some consensus nomenclature. So, um, and uh, hit this, this is the table on it. So um, we, the recommended term on, because we now use multimodal imaging. So we call the lesions are the polypoidal lesions and also the branching neovascular network. And you can refer these in the discussion in the table. So in, um, when we shortlisted the criteria, we actually found nine uh, non ICJ features which might be which might be useful. So here are uh, listed here. The first is the sharp peak PED. Um, second is this uh, sub RP ring like lesion. Thirdly is the complex multi lobular PED. Fourthly is the uh, double layer sign, and then it's the thickened choroid with the dilated halo vessels. And um, then you get the fluid compartment. So mainly it's a subrectal fluid and you sometimes do not get much intrarectal fluid in PCV patients. And um, this is the on fast OCT uh, complex RP elevation. And then if in the fundus feature, we have two features. So extensive subrectal hemorrhage or the orange nodule. So by looking at all these, and then uh, we uh, found that three of the features were uh, most um, predictive of uh, uh, PCV. So the first one is sub IP ring light lesion within the AUC of uh, 0.83, and then followed by on fast OCT complex RP elevation, that's um, about 0.82, and then sharp peak PED about 0.79. And this uh, actually gives uh, quite a reasonable sensitivity and specificity. Uh, specificity. And so you can compare all these um, with different combination of two major criteria, or three major criteria, and that will achieve about 0.9 uh, of the AUC. So in summary, um, in routine clinical practice, so uh, these non-ICGA diagnostic features such as the fundus and SDOCT signs can often establish a diagnosis of PCV and spectral domain OCT is uh, very useful to determine the activity of uh, PCV as well as to monitor the treatment response following anti-VGF monotherapy. And um, ICJ remains the gold standard for the diagnosis of PCV and uh, it's still the main guide when we plan for combination therapy using PDT and anti-VGF therapy. So thank you very much. Thank you, Timothy, for a fantastic talk. Uh, 
I mean, uh, I think uh, the world is always looking for less invasive methods of diagnosing macular disease. And uh, I mean, I think this work by APOS is a, a great uh, effort in that direction. Uh, I just wanted to do uh, your, the slide which you showed about the angulation and the work done on that, that was very interesting. I just wanted your comment on what we are beginning to see increasingly in India and recognize uh, this flat irregular PEDs. A lot of uh, cases seem to have that. So that again, you know, it goes a little uh, uh, again uh, against uh, this uh, tall uh, thumb requirement. I mean that angulation. So what is your comment on that? Do you see a lot of them in your PCV cases, flat irregular PEDs? We do see some of those, but uh, usually they are the multi-lobulated ones, uh, which are like M-shaped uh, kind of PED, rather than uh, just a, a smooth kind of um, uh, uh, flat kind of PD elevation. So um, with the uh, use of uh, OCTA, I think you can probably pick up some of these polyps as well, but uh, I don't have time to go through OCTA. And um, so, uh, but many of the cases, because the flow of the um, blood inside these polypoidal lesions, they might be a bit slow or they are having turbulent flow. So the Branching the vascular network could be picked up very well by the OCTA, but uh, the polypoidal lesions, they, um, with the existing algorithm, probably not as good. May I ask yeah, please, uh, please, uh, uh, Timothy, I have a question. Uh, we have seen uh, the other eye features uh, in a PCV case. Sometimes you just have uh, what has been called as some soft drusens there, or they are quite away from the center. Has anybody looked at that part? Because that is uh, another feature of what may be non-invasive as well as we we'll, uh, know about evolution of the disease right from the beginning. Has other eye been studied like uh, uh, in the beginning when the lesions are probably very subtle? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful question. So uh, I, the longitudinal studies have definitely looked at this as well. So we can uh, use the uh, clinical trial data, for example, to look at the fellow eye because sometimes the fellow eye will have uh, the uh, quiescent lesion seen in the ICG angiography, but these uh, lesions typically pre uh, present very slowly. So they might not um, uh, have any effect on the vision. So we do not treat these uh, quiescent lesions until they have uh, extradative active activity. Yes, Andrew. Uh, Timothy, fantastic talk. Can I ask if you have had any racial variation in the OCT appearances of polypodals, that is polypodal disease in Caucasian patients versus uh, Asians or Oriental Asians versus Indian patients? Well, very good question because uh, I think uh, in most of the cases we see in uh, in Hong Kong and Singapore and Tokyo or uh, in Korea, Japan, so these are mainly uh, on Oriental Asians. But uh, if you uh, talk to Greg Kokami, for example, he's in Hawaii and um, he does see a fair few uh, uh, Caucasian patients with PCV2. And uh, he mentioned that uh, most of the uh, uh, findings were quite similar, although the location might be a bit different. So you get a more per papillary lesions in the uh, Caucasian populations, for example. So I think Dr. Pison, we can move on. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, we can move on for the next talk. Uh, the speaker will be Dr. Jamie Cheng from Singapore. She's from Singapore National Eye Center. She's also the, uh, the council member of FURS. And she received many international awards and, of course, uh, a lot of uh, international papers. Uh, may I ask Dr. Jamie Cheng to present the new insights into alterations of collateral perfusion in PCV and CSC. Please, Jamie. Thank you very much, Paisa, for the kind introduction. And uh, many thanks for the invitation from both AIOC and uh, APVRS to join today. So um, uh, I very much enjoyed Dr. Atul's talk just now, highlighting uh, many of the uh, factors that we're still 
uh, haven't completely understood about pachychoroid and uh, maybe uh, central serous is the uh, most typical of the diseases within the pachychoroid spectrum. And of course, uh, as Timothy has mentioned in our population, PCV is another very uh, uh, common lesion. So um, if we go back to uh, central serous, our understanding has again, uh, really evolved with the uh, advances of imaging. We know that from uh, early on, we mostly concentrated on what's happening above the RPE. We use mainly SA and we looked for these uh, RPE uh, kind of uh, punctures uh, and leakages. And subsequently, uh, using ICGA was then first highlighted that there was a lot of um, changes within these eyes. Uh, particularly, we noted congestion of the large choroidal vessels. This is even very early on before we relied on OCT and definitely before OCTA came into clinical practice. And you can see in the late phase, there is uh, choroidal hyperpermeability as well. And concurrently, then we then subsequently, this is paper back in 2009 using EDI OCT, noticed that in central serous choroidal retinopathy, as they also have a thickened choroid which goes hand in hand with that appearance we noted on ICGA. That led to our renaming of central serous retinopathy to central serous choroidal retinopathy with the hypothesis now um, commonly accepted as choroid being the primary uh, location of the disease, starting with choroidal hyperpermeability and that pressure goes up one layer at a time through decompensation of the RPE and leading to neurosensory detachment eventually and damaging the photoreceptor. Similar findings in the choroid have also been mentioned in uh, PCV. Uh, this is again very early paper uh, back in 2011 showing that thickened choroid uh, was noted in PCV as much as they are seen in central serous choroid retinopathy and contrasting very much so to those eyes with typical AMD. So we now use a combination of thickness based on OCT and together with ICGA showing in not just thickness uh, in the paper on the right, but also vascular hyperpermeability uh, being some of the key features we see in this group of disease, which as Dr. Atu said, now we group them as this name called pachychoroid, which I'm not sure is helpful or not because that like, there is so much controversy with this name. So that's all uh, relatively known. And in the next few minutes, I'd like to just highlight some of the newer uh, studies. We know what are the descriptive features as mentioned, but still we don't understand what led to these. And uh, Dr. Arthur mentioned the concept of choroidal congestion, uh, which seems to be something that we're looking more and more uh, to us. So first of all, um, using OCT and geography, it is great. We can look at these large choroidal vessels non-invasively, and we can look at generally most papers uh, highlight these changes within the macular region, as you can see in this example. However, um, the, the, there is a limit to the uh, field of view, and we generally call these pachy vessels. We characterize them as deep choroidal vessels, increased caliber. Again, there is no threshold for calling what is big or small. They generally also, in terms of morphology, do not taper towards the posterior pole, which is where we expect the physiological watershed zone to be and may terminate abruptly as well. So if we just examine the macular region, we can see this kind of image with ICG or the one that I showed you just now with OCTA. Recently, we had the opportunity to look further out, and this is with wide field ICTA. We find that, of course, we see these vessels either next to the disc or in the macular region. But when we look further out, they seem to be linked to or connected to uh, two, at least two or even more separate vortex systems. As you can see in this example, you can see uh, anastomotic uh, connections as highlighted here. There's another eye showing you several anastomotic uh, connections. And this is one, another eye in the paper, which shows these connections are around the disc when it comes to peripapillary pachychoroid syndrome, and they tend to be more so in the macular region when it comes to central serous and PCV. Now, then if these are anastomotic vessels, it is not purely a matter of temporary dilation because of chemical uh, changes, etc. So what leads to this uh, uh, remodeling of these vessels? 
uh, if we look back at the formation of collaterals, for example, in retinal vein occlusion, we know that there may be some um, uh, pressure gradient defects. This is just to highlight that um, uh, similar findings have been noted, not using ICGA, but using OCT angiography, uh, not so much in terms of wide field, but similar kind of concept. Uh, a lot of work has been done by the Japanese group led by Dr. Matsumoto and Akiyama as well. And recently there has been a very nice review uh, by Ashish Sharma uh, and, uh, and co-authors as well. Just I'd like to uh, highlight these if you're interested in this topic. So recently we looked at what's happening in terms of the filling within these dilated vessels by looking at the dynamic ICG. And in quite a few eyes, we find that you can see this kind of sluggish motion almost like an RVO um, uh, cattle tracking kind of appearance. And this is of course happening in the large choroidal vessels. And these often can be seen to connect segments of proximal and distal dilated uh, vessel segments as well. Here in this case, you can see very clearly this blood uh, column of blood is trying very hard to push its way from the left towards the right and eventually linking up the two segments. And when we look at the late still image, when the filling has completed, we'll say, yeah, this is a uh, packy vessel or an elastomotic connection, but it is really the dynamic filling that tells us um, maybe this vessel formed because of some sort of um, congestion and outflow obstruction. And in fact, very interestingly, this kind of concept has been highlighted long ago. It's now with additional small pieces of uh, of the jigsaw puzzle with that we are trying to put them together. This is very nice work done uh, by Korean group back in 2013, suggesting that there may be uh, outflow obstruction or congestion at the very least in the vortex system. So what is the implication? So we see these findings. I think for now, at least we've mentioned that in terms of treatment, we've noted that um, corridor sickness comes down with PDT, with certain anti-VGF, but not so if we are only doing thermal laser. And that seems to suggest that it may be good to have a, a reduction in that thickening or congestion within these choroidal vessels. And the question is, can we achieve that? And how could we achieve that? Uh, and this is another paper from Hong Kong group, um, Timothy was uh, involved, uh, showing with PDT, as you can see in the example on the right hand side, that the permeability comes down uh, on the ICJ after a half dose PDT. We'll come back to this image in a moment. So what is important is that when we talk about the choroid, we've looked at various parameters. I've talked about the anastomotic vessels, which are the vessels themselves. And then I've talked about hyperpermeability, which is the diffusion of the dye and the exudation into the choroidal stroma. And another a uh, new piece of tool that may come into just the right time is the choroidal vascularity index, which has been, again, knocking around for the past five to six years. And it is basically binarizing the choroidal segment. And now, in addition to manually doing it in the sub subfluvial region, we are able to do a volumetric uh, assessment. So you can have a CVI map uh, automated as such. Uh, and we're using that uh, in the beta version of the TopCon algorithm. And you can monitor the changes as uh, this eye go undergoes. Uh, it looks at treatment for PCV from baseline to month three to month 12. On the right hand side, you can see that the corridor thickness comes down, but also the corridor vascularity index came down in this eye. In, even if you eyeball that OCT on the left hand side, you can see that the corridor is generally looking less dark with time. Now, when we plotted that against a, a cohort of 17 eyes, what's quite interesting is this is choroidal thickness in the y-axis and the, the red dotted line shows you the no change from at month 12 to baseline line. And we find that by and large, most eyes showed a reduction in choroidal thickness, quite marked reduction, in fact, up to 20 to 30%. What happens to choroidal vascularity? So here is plotted in the x-axis, again, in the dotted line is the no change line. And we found that by and large, there was very little excursion, only about 4% changes either way. And not only that, with that marked reduction in thickness, we were quite surprised to find that some eyes, ironically, 
um, had an increase in choroidal vascularity index. So what does that mean? How can choroidal vascularity index increase a sickness decrease? Well, uh, going back to the two components within the choroid, it will suggest that the dilated vessel lumen are still there because they are anastomotic segments. They don't just go away, don't do, they don't just close up. Maybe they are less congested. And looking at that example on the right from the uh, Hong Kong um, paper, you can see that the vascular hyperpermeability gets better, but the dilated segments are still there. And concurrently, you can see a reduction in stromal congestion. And I would not be surprised if we apply the CDI in this eye, we show that the thickness comes down, but the CDI actually increases. So just in summary, we've um, uh, highlighted some of the established choroidal features. And with newer imaging, we can maybe um, have a new kind of um, understanding uh, to some of these features that we've described in terms of hyperpermeability, um, it may be uh, due to choroidal outflow disturbance in terms of just the dilated halus vessels. Now we hypothesize that these are not just dilated, but in fact, anastomotic segments and the increased thickness may, uh, may be due to venous stasis and leakage. And ultimately, the CVI may be a new mechanism that we can study the different components within the choroid. And the question uh, that I will end is, would reduction in choroidal hyperpermeability rather than looking for reduction in the thickness be something that uh, would be an additional treatment endpoint that we want to look for in the future. So thank you very much for the opportunity for me to share with you these findings. Fabulous uh, talk again, uh, Jamie. It's always exciting to listen to you and your thoughts on the choroid. Uh, I mean, uh, you kind of answered something that was uh, came up in my mind in the, uh, as you progressed with your presentation, is that that you know uh, when we look at this new concept of vortex vein anastomosis, do you think these anastomotic channels are there, you know, as congenital variants and which are just opening up as the entire vortex vein system is becoming congested, or as we also know and you alluded in your presentation that choroid uh, vasculature we know gets remodeled as a compensatory mechanism. Could it be uh, a general variation? These people are predisposed, and that's where you also probably touched in, you know, when you have, you know, decreasing thickness, you still can have increasing CVI. So what are your thoughts on that? So if we look at some histological um, description, the, it is known that there are small connecting vasculature within uh, uh, the choroidal watershed zone, uh, which are usually quite small. But as you said, when there is an outflow obstruction and we're, uh, we, we still don't know where exactly that's happening, possibly uh, in, uh, in the aura, some, somewhere like that, um, that uh, leads to increased and uh, a reduced uh, a kind of stasis within one segment, then that slowly opens up some of these pre-existing small channels and make them larger and larger. And that, that becomes a vicious cycle as, as the blood flow within that system increases, then these channels would open up even more. Uh, I had a question. Uh, yes, please, sir. Jimmy and to Timothy, sorry. I was just thinking in diaptic retropathy, we have uh, decreased oxygen because the oxygen consuming, the oxygen carrying capacity is decreased. So there's a, a compensatory venous congestion, venous dilatation, shunt vessels, which we call anastomosis, which we call in IRMAs open out. So is it something similar that we have a decreased oxygenation of the choroid in uh, pachychoroid disease? The decreased oxygenation is causing congestion of the veins. So shunt vessels, which you see between the vortex vessels do the form because the shunt vessels like IRM is in the diaptic retropathy. So is it the oxygen conditions who are hyper anxiety individuals or who have propensity to develop pachychoroid disease or I'm just uh, hypothesizing. I mean, I think that's uh, a great thought. And what we exactly know is the best to and get congested and there's a, dec a decrease or there's increased outflow. So in diabetics, various papers have described yes, either a, 
uh, increase in the choroidal thickness, and some papers shows a decrease in choroidal thickness. So I think, in fact, in choro choroidal thickness in diabetics itself is unresolved, and it may well depend on the stage and severity of diabetic retinopathy. So I agree with you that definitely oxygenation disturbance uh, has something to do with uh, some of these choroidal changes. For um, the CSC type of eyes currently, I think we're particularly looking at change, a much more mechanical uh, mechanism. So changes in perfusion pressure or outflow pressure. So I think all of these mechanisms should be studied in future. Yeah, and there yeah. are some good evidence uh, from the uh, Japanese group, especially in uh, Sapporo, uh, uh, they have uh, done some study on using the um, laser spec uh, speculometer to look at the oxygenation of the retina, and they found some uh, choroid localized choroidal schema in patient CSC. So that's a very interesting area to look at. Yeah, Jamie, do you think this uh, concept can be applied to PCB as well? Yes, I think so. Um, probably the choroidal changes is offers a common background, but some have suggested that uh, in addition to get neovascular complication, there may be an additional genetic component. So we know that not every CSC or chronic CSC eyes end up with neovascularization, and that is still one of the great questions. Why should that be the case? Great. Uh, Go ahead, Dr. Uh, yeah, sorry, Jenny. Um, so do you use in clinical practice um, an assessment of the choroidal thickness if you're assessing whether a patient's active or not? Not really. Um, I think particular, I think Timothy would, uh, um, would yes. comment um, more for VKH, I think not so much for AMD and PCB. Right, right, okay. I have a question. What is the best way, as you have proposed, that choroidal hyperpermeability may be the best way to look at your treatment in the final, uh, this thing, how, uh, the, how they do it? So what, what is the best way to sort of uh, uh, look for choroidal permeability repeatedly if we want to really look at what has happened to that? So what, what would be the best way? Yeah. Well, um, I think Jamie's done some wonderful work in uh, <laughs> um, the looking at the uh, choroidal vascularity index, the CVI. We've done some work in that area as well, and um, so, uh, but it's very time-consuming thing to do uh, looking at the CVI. But then with the uh, Topcon, they now have the like the CVI map. I think that's quite interesting actually. And um, I, Jamie's published a paper, I think in PLOS One or something uh, that uh, there's actually uh, some normalization of CVI after treatment uh, with a combination therapy or with um, just uh, anti-VGF therapy. So I think that's a one, uh, one of the method to look at, but uh, unfortunately we don't have a good data on this uh, from the the clinical trials and we did look at the uh, choroidal uh, um, thickness in uh, some of the clinical trials uh, particularly Everest 2 and also in Planet to see if any predictive value of these but uh, um, the findings were not that specific. You had muted uh, on it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I have another small theory. Uh, we've talked about uh, vortex vein congestion and the entire venous uh, system contributing to choroidal congestion and uh, this blow out of CSR and PCV. But I'd like to just throw in uh, something into your thoughts about scleral permeability. So uh, in uvular fusion syndrome, which I think is at the end of this, you know, pachychoroid syndrome, uh, again, that's been implicated in uvular fusion syndrome and decompressing that by doing a sclerectomy. Is an, is an option. Now, there was an interesting, very interesting anecdotal report from Ames, which uh, showed that, you know, partial sclerectomy improved the case of a chronic CSCR. I think it was Dr. Pradeep Venkatesh's uh, uh, group. So, uh, what, is your, what are your thoughts on that? We've talked about the venous systems, but the role of, you know, the scleral permeability, which has been implicated. And then that's really interesting. So uh, I would, my current thought would be, so the outflow obstruction would be the primary cause and that the back pressure gets transmitted to the whole of posterior pole. 
then the vessels get dilated. Then when that cannot, that kind of decompensates, all the leakage come out into the stroma and the whole choroid becomes like a sponge swelling up. And once it's been shown that for choroid that is thicker than 400 micron, generally we start to collect a suprachoroidal effusion. And probably in those eyes, it is the completely, um, there was so much fluid in there that the, uh, it also um, uh, congests the scleral outflow. So I would imagine normally up to like 300 something micron, the scleral outflow also contributes to some of that, uh, clearing up that um, leakage into the choroidal stroma. And when that additional mechanism also gets uh, uh, um, uh, overwhelmed, then we've got this massive um, congestion problem. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we'll move ahead. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce my uh, co-moderator and chair of the session, Dr. Faisal Andrum, uh, who is the president of the Royal College of uh, Ophthalmology of Thailand, uh, the student director at the Rajavati Hospital, numerous awards at the Asia Pacific uh, level and a leader here. It's my pleasure to ask him to the question to speak on artificial intelligence for AMD and PCB. Dr. Faisal. Thank you, Dr. Anand. It's my great pleasure and honor to be invited to this symposium. Here's my financial disclosure. Well, um, the aims of using AI for AMD or PCV is maybe uh, at the primary care, you may want to screen uh, patients with AMD in populations. In tertiary care, you may want to use AI as an assessing, assessing tool for AMD detection, monitoring, or decision making for AMD in clinics or in research. Well, in terms of image analysis, you may be able to use AI for analysis on color fundus photo, OCT, and some other images like OCT air or angiogram. I'm going to focus on color fundus photo and OCT today. In terms of color fundus photo, the most common objective for um, using AI for analyzing on the color fundus photo may be um, using it as the screening or detection tool for the variable AMD or detecting light AMD. Most of the studies so far use a data set from the ARES study, which is a last study. But most of the study contain validation within the data sets from ARES. There's no validation in new data sets yet. And most of the report uh, achieved quite a good results. The area under the IOC curve was around 90% for detection and around 70% for prediction. I'm gonna show you later. Uh, this is an example of a study that used AI for uh, analysis on color fundus photo of AMD and classify AMD into like four step scale and nine step scale. In terms of four step scale, the Kappa score was found to be like 0 0.77. For nine step scale, the Kappa is about uh, 0 0.74. In terms of prediction of the five year risk of AMD, the mean estimation error found in this study range from 3.5% to 5.3%. Here, if you have a look at the, uh, the accuracy of the human grader over here for the four step scale is 73.8%, uh, but for AI is 75.7%. But if you use AI for uh, making classification on nine step scale, the accuracy come down to be only like 60%. This is another study using AI for automated detection of GA from color fundus photo. This is, uh, this is for uh, detection of GA as a whole. The AUC is around uh, 0 0.9. And this picture, this is for detecting central GA. The AUC is also 0 0.9. But in terms of detection cent centrality of the lesions, the AUC has come down a little bit to be around 0 0.8. This is another interesting paper. They tried to use AI for detecting reticular pseudodrusen from uh, fundus autofluorescent images and color fundus images as well. Well, um, in terms of reticular pseudodrusen, it may be better detect using uh, FAF, right? Instead of color fundus photo. But we try to use color fundus photo to detect. Anyway, uh, if you have reticular pseudodrusen at baseline, you're gonna have the lead AMD faster than if you didn't have the Dusen at baseline. For this uh, study, the AI was developed by uh, having data from the FAF and they transfer the data into the color fundus photo. And then at the end, they developed two model. The first model is doing uh, detection on analysis on uh, FAF and another model is performing analysis on the color fundus 
photo, which have data transfer from FAF into the color fundus photo. Well, uh, for the validation data set, well, they try to find the best model and they find that, well, um, if they use the model to analysis on the FAF, the AUC is 0 0.94, but for the color fundus photo, the AUC is 0 0.83, slightly lower. Well, for the testing data set, when they compare to human experts, for the model that make analysis on the color fundus photo, well, uh, you can see the AUC um, is slightly lower than the FAF model, but it's still better than the uh, human experts over here. In terms of uh, the heat maps that the AI use for analysis on both uh, image domain, you can see the, the heat map on both uh, the FAF and the color fundus photo is around the same area. It's quite a similar area. It seems that AI using the same area. It doesn't matter is on the FAF or the color fundus photo. How about the OCT images in IMD? Well, um, in this study, the authors would like to um, classify OCT images into uh, cases which may need anti vegf injection and cases which may not need anti vegf injection. Actually, this is a classification test of the AI. You can see the AUC from this study is pretty high. AUC is approach one in this study. This is another study using AI on OCT for segmentation test. You can see the OCT over here, right? The original image. And you have a greater number one to perform a kind of manual, uh, uh, manual segmentation on the internal fluid and subnal fluid. This is the greater number two, manual segmentation. And this is the uh, segmentation by the AI. Actually, the segmentation test can be performed on the color fundus photo as well. This is the uh, segmentation of the vessels from the greater number one, manual segmentation, and greater number two. And then you can see the AI perform the uh, automated segmentation of the vessels. The next test is predicting test. Well, in this study, they use data from Harbor study they use data and OCT images from the loading phase, and they develop an AI try to predict how many injections the patients may need, and they classify the outcome into like no low number of injections, medium number of injections, and high number of injections. This is another study try to do prediction. They try to predict the conversion into wet AMD from using AI. Well, this is quite interesting because well, um, they use the data from the fellow eye of patients who already have uh, wet AMD in one eye and had treatment. For the fellow eyes OCT, they use the, uh, the deep learning segmentation model to perform a tissue segmentation, as I showed you before. And adding to that, they developed two additional models. The first model is to perform prediction whether or not the OCT is going to have uh, wet AMD in the future. Uh, they perform the prediction on the segmented OCT. This is the model number one. And they developed model number two to perform prediction on the OCT images that didn't have any segmentation before. And they combine these two models together and they perform the prediction for having a uh, conversion to be with AMD within the next six months. And over here is the example of a case which have, which have OCT images and it turned out that it uh, converted into like wet AMD at 11 months. If you have a look at the, the model in this uh, study, the model AUC is 0 0.77, which is pretty good for prediction. If you compare to the human graders, the render specialist is around here, it's pretty close to the AI, but AI is, is better. But if you compare to the optometrist, the optometrist is much lower. You compare to using Dusen volume to make a prediction of conversion, the Dusen volume is kind of performance is lower than the AI. And if you use the hyper reflective for size, the same thing is lower than the AI. This is another uh, study to try to use AI for detecting PCB without ICGA, maybe the, the same objective as Tim uh, said earlier. Well, in this data set from, from China, they classify cases into like normal, dry AMD, PCV, and wet AMD. And they train the model. They developed two models for this study. The first model is to make analysis on the color fundus photos. And another model is to do analysis on the OCT images. And then they combine the two models together. 
and to make a detection on the uh, data on both color fundus photo and OCT and classify into the healthy dry AMD, PCV, and wet AMD. And this is the, uh, the performance of the, the model. You can see, well, um, from the test set, the, uh, the model which combine data from uh, color fundus and OCT perform the best. The F1 score here is 0 0.894 compared to the human graders, which read the same set of images without any ICGA is 0 0.85. But if the same set of images was um, analyzed from the, the, uh, the deep learning or AI, that web analysis on only OCTA, only OCT, I'm sorry, only OCT, the F8, the F1 score is only 0 0.759. You have a look at the ROC curve here. You can see the deep learning combination of both um, color images and OCT perform the best, AUC 0.939. So in summary, from 2018 to 2020, there were more than like 150 papers on AI for AMD published. And many publications from uh, engineering fields and focus on technical issues. Most studies did not have validation in new data sets from external population. And there are more paper make analysis on OCT than color fundus photo. And there are more AI on clinical management in clinics than screening in population. So this is different from the R screening. However, there's only a few AI models are used for management of AMD in the real world at the moment. Thank you very much for your attention. It's my pleasure to be invited to speak here. Thank you. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Paisan. That, that was again a very insightful uh, you know, uh, overview of what we're beginning to see more often, you know, the role of artificial intelligence. I don't know whether we should be uh, happy or we should be worried. Dr. Jemmy showed us a little while ago, uh, Dr. Rather, about you know, how ICG is going to be put out of business by uh, non-ICGA uh, uh, techniques, uh, non-invasive techniques. And now you're showing us that perhaps we may not be needed for uh, picking up these uh, lesions. So uh, going forwards, uh, Dr. Jemmy, what are your thoughts on how, you know, uh, Past, you know, uh, AI can be used not only predicting uh, the uh, incidents and prevalence, but also, you know, actually offering us therapeutic, I, I mean, insight into therapeutic solutions. I think um, there is so much that we, we are just trying to learn that the potential is huge, definitely. Um, what uh, I find it may be, um, may be still a uh, a potential limitation is that many of these test sets are a little bit hypothetical, right. that they are not in the real world when a patient comes in, could be having any diagnosis under the sun, whereas in, in generally in the training set, they are limited to either a binary outcome or maybe several potential outcome. So um, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, and I think that is not a huge um, limitation, but in terms of the application and the setting of where we will, uh, will apply that to, pro probably that will come into play. Uh, definitely in terms of within the hands of the uh, specialist, it will be a great tool. Uh, it will uh, uh, cut down a lot of labor time, grading, grading center time, things like that. Now, um, how it is going to go into the general um, ophthalmologist or even non-ophthalmologist uh, 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 when the AI potentially knows more than the doctors. I think that uh, it's really up to us uh, and Paisan, uh, the leaders in AI to help to mold how we're going to use the system. Yeah, I think I, I totally agree with, with Jamie. Well, most of the studies, they just conduct the validation in the in internal data set. So it's the same, well, it's the same data set, but uh, the AI may, may not be able to have a look at those data before they perform the validation. So that's the reason why the, uh, the results pretty good. Well, and well, and the AI that didn't perform well, they're not gonna be published anyway, right? So, well, um, you're gonna see a lot of uh, good performance of AI published in the literature today, but in terms of using this in the real world, I think it's gonna take a while. I think the R is gonna be well uh, a step forward. It's, I think it's well ahead before AMD. I think for the R screening, I think uh, the, the the model which have been approved by the FDA, 
it's only being used in some supermarkets in the US and it's autonomous. It doesn't need any like human credit to, to assist and the FDA approve it that way. So this is, this is different. Well, we have a kind of two models uh, that FDA approved before the, the, the DR model, but in both X-ray model and I can remember another model, uh, FDA approved in the way that you need human assist. But for DR model, the FDA approved in the way that you don't need any human to, to assist that. And now it's been deployed in, in many, many areas in the US already. So yeah, it's quite interesting. Yeah, it may decrease our labor force, as Jamie said. I agree, totally agree with that. But we're gonna see. I think AI is gonna help us a lot. And I don't think it's gonna make us to lose our job. It's gonna assist us. And we need to, this is the reason why we need to work with the engineer to, to guide them to be in the, I mean, the, the good direction, the correct direction. Yeah, we need to work with them. I just want to make I a point to that- me. I just want to make a point that probably uh, uh, Pachycora disease is such a complex entity with so many signs and symptoms, uh, signs, you know, in the choroid, as you just heard, and with so many investigations involved that it won't be so easy with through AI to actually pinpoint the disease and the severity of the disease and also when should we treat. Yeah. So, of course, for diaptic retinopathy, it is being used and I think it would have a role for primary care physicians like telemedicine that you, uh, you know, smaller places like in India, we have small places where they developed lesions similar to pachycoroid disease or AMD. So we can transport the images and then study and then call the patient over and go get him through the various imaging modalities. So it will have a definite role, but uh, it'll take some time, I think. And uh, to me, uh, it appears uh, that AI is going to be a big thing in diagnosis. So maybe we'll get to treat uh, patients earlier and our role will be more treating patients. And it is going to come probably in various diseases for diagnosis. But once they are detected early and that's where if it is used, maybe we'll have uh, better treatment available to the patients at the earlier stage. That is what it appears at this time, although it's too early to uh, sort of uh, <laughs> talk about that. Yeah. Yes, I think one thing we all understand is that AI is going to push medicine in the direction it should, that is into preventive uh, care rather than you know reactive care, which is you know treating something very bad down the line. So maybe we'll be able to pick up disease earlier and do more uh, preventive uh, therapy. So thank you, uh, Dr. Bison, again, and I think we can we can progress to our final speaker, Dr. Andrew. Yeah, um, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce our last speaker this morning, Dr. Andrew Chang from Sydney Eye Center in Australia. He's the um, uh, Secretary General of the Asia Pacific Veterinary Society, and he won many international awards and published a lot of international papers already. Actually, he did no introduction. You please go ahead, Andrew. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. of course. Thank you very much, Paisan, and thank you very much for inviting the APBRS to uh, join with you uh, today. Very special day. I'm going to talk today about submacular hemorrhage and polypodal uh, vasculopathy. And very few conditions can lead to massive hemorrhage. And this is what I'm going to focus on today. So in that case, it's had a, uh, a massive hemorrhage. We can see here that uh, uh, with ICG, we can identify polyps as the cause of this. Subretinal bleeding causes a devastating and permanent loss of sight through various mechanisms, mechanical traction, iron toxicity, and impairing diffusion of nutrients. It also leads to long-term damage through subretinal fibrosis and scarring. We have a number of tools for treating subretinal hemorrhage, gas, TPA, vitrectomy, anti-VEGF, and we've heard a little bit about this today, and also thermal MPDT laser. And the options depend on 
the vision of the patient, their ability to posture and cooperate with post-operative uh, instructions, as well as the extent and location of the blood. Let me first talk about intravitreal gas displacement. And this was first proposed by Wilson Herriot from Australia in 1996. Uh, there was some concern following this about potential uh, retinal toxicity. Um, and Matt Oji then explored the options of intravitreal gas injection without TPA. Uh, then there was a concern that TPA may not pass through into the subretinal space when given intravitreally. And uh, our American colleagues and also Dr. Shiraga in uh, Japan explored options of subretinal TPA injection. And then um, we've also heard today about adding anti-VEGF uh, to uh, the TPA gas, which potentially can increase uh, our outcomes. This is a 50 year old Indonesian female who presented to me with acute loss of sight. We can see here a large subretinal hemorrhage. And we gave her an intravitreal SF6 injection, 100% gas. And this expands to twice the volume the following day. And we can see here that the hemorrhage has now been displaced inferiorly. Day seven, there's continued movement of the subretinal hemorrhage. A fluorescent angiogram was then performed and the ICG showed us the polyps which were suspected to be the cause of the submacular bleed. And at this stage, uh, it was some years ago, she had a Vastin and settled uh, well following this. Let's move on now to vitrectomy surgery. And Jean Dewan and Robert Mackema um, in the uh, late 80s and early 90s proposed vitrectomy with very large retinectomies, plus or minus uh, full uh, translocation surgery for these sorts of cases. Uh, then um, our Japanese colleagues explored sub vitrectomy and subretinal TPA and explored heavy liquid to massage blood through a draining retinotomy. Um, Yusuke Oshima also started to describe a peripheral uh, retinectomy to drain blood. But these surgeries are major surgeries and have significant potential complications such as detachment, PVR, which is a dreaded complication, macular holes and membranes that can form over the macula. This is a 52 year old uh, Thai female who presented with a vitreous hemorrhage and her referring retinal specialist thought she may have had a retinal detachment. As you can see here, it's a little elevated there was no significant previous ocular history. She underwent uh, vitrectomy and drainage. This is the uh, setup with uh, 23 uh, vitrectomy. Once we're inside the eye, the small amount of breakthrough blood is removed. And we can see here a hemorrhage and likely polyps in this region, which cause the bleed. The um, Elevation bisected the macula, it split the macula. So um, here we're attempting to uh, drain it. So we're using heavy liquid to uh, displace the blood away from uh, the macula. And as the blood moves into the periphery displaced by the heavy liquid, endodiathermy is used to create a small retinotomy through which the blood is able to be uh, removed. So some of the blood was able to, um, that is the liquefied part was able to come out. And then I also here used a retinal cryotherapy probe with external massage to try to shift the rest of the blood out through that small retinotomy. 
Here, most of the blood was able to be removed and uh, the advantage of heavy liquid is that the blood uh, was uh, um, displaced uh, on the surface of it and exited out of the other um, sclerostomy ports. So at the conclusion of the case, um, heavy liquid was kept inside the eye and then five days later, the patient was taken back to the operating room to remove the heavy liquid. We can see there's some um, macrophagic response on the back of the uh, crystalline lens. The heavy liquid is able to be uh, removed. The retina is uh, well attached. The retinotomy is sealed. And this patient recovered um, quite a lot of sight. Day seven, uh, after uh, surgery, the gas bubble uh, is uh, going and she did quite well. This is another patient who's 62 years, he's Chinese. And at this stage, an ICG showed a extrafovial polyp and discussions were uh, took place as to whether this should be treated or treated with uh, thermal laser or PDT. And my colleague at that stage decided to treat it with um, laser. Um, and we can see here the uh, photo immediately after the treatment. Uh, there was closure of uh, the uh, polyp uh, and it was successful and vision uh, was stable at six over 60. Um, he then unfortunately um, presented um, uh, with a recurrence and this was treated with PDT and following the recurrence, he sustained a massive subretinal hemorrhage as you can see here. It covers virtually all of the posterior poles and even um, extending into the uh, equator. Uh, he then came under my care and I treated him uh, with a pneumatic displacement using C3F8 gas. And a week after the gas injection, his condition continued to deteriorate. He described a shadow coming over his uh, vision. Visual acuity fell to hand movements only with a diffuse hemorrhage. And this is the B scan ultrasound showing a subretinal clot here and breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage. We managed him conservatively at that time, anticipating the poor prognosis and that the vitreous hemorrhage might resolve on its own. Unfortunately, he continued to deteriorate and he has now a massive subretinal hemorrhage. And having discussed uh, the options with him and his family, we elected to drain the blood. So this is his uh, surgery, um, very dramatic large, large um, subretinal uh, hemorrhages, been there for a little while. And here I'm using uh, heavy liquid, again, in an attempt to um, displace some of the blood, at least from the uh, macular uh, region. And then um, a peripheral uh, retinotomy uh, is made. Um, I use a cutter uh, for this and was able to remove some of the blood, but not all. And he ultimately did poorly and the eye became thysical. So risk of massive hemorrhage after uh, PDT uh, does occur, it has been uh, reported both in the Japanese and also in the uh, Hong Kong group. Um, it's one of the um, risks that I do discuss uh, with patients now if I choose to treat them uh, with PDT. So in conclusion, subretinal bleeds causes uh, devastating vision loss. In my practice, uh, intravitreal gas injection uh, to pneumatically displace the blood is the first line. Vitrectomy is really now used in very selected cases. Heavy liquid is useful as an adjunct. 
um, peripheral iridotomy if one wants to drain the blood um, peripherally. And often there is also um, some exudative detachment that requires drainage as well. And um, as touched on, uh, these patients still need uh, ongoing treatment with uh, anti-VEGF uh, therapy. Thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Andrew. Again, uh, a wonderful uh, uh, lecture and great surgeries. I just wanted to ask you a couple of things. Uh, the use of uh, PFCL, which again, uh, I think Dr. Steve Charles also is a great votary of. Uh, when you put in PFCL and you take it out five to seven days later, uh, do you mandate your patients that they should be, you know, in lying down position so that the maximum tamponading effect uh, vector forces act on the posterior polar you find with them uh, moving around and coming back later? Do you keep them in admission? Uh, I guess you probably no, no, put no. them back later. Um, the surgeries are done, uh, day surgeries, as almost all vitreoretinal surgeries are done now. The heavy liquid... Um, has tamponading effect depending on how somebody is positioned. So it might be that you might position somebody initially on the right-hand side and then roll them over to the other side several days later to try and shift the blood away. Or you may be very concerned that the retinotomy that you've created could be the focus of PVR and might open up. So you might then spend some of the time on their back to protect the macula and then lean them onto the side where you have made the retinotomy. The other, the other um, tip is uh, while a patient has heavy liquid in the eye, um, I really tell them not to move around too much. Um, if you move around too much, it, the, um, the heavy liquid breaks up into little bubbles and it makes its way through zonules, it sits in the anterior chamber. It's quite difficult to, to get out. Another aspect of heavy liquid um, and how long it can be kept in the eye is, um, is very much related in the, uh, on the um, it depends on the inflammatory reaction that is inside the eye. So one of the things I look for very early on is KP on the back of the lens or KP on the retinal, so the macrophagic response that you get when you have heavy liquid in the eye. So usually I will see nothing at three days or four days. At five days, it's starting to happen. And that is when I really then head into the OR and take the heavy liquid out. So I usually will see, if, if I do this, I'll see a patient at three days. If it looks good, then maybe two days later, I will, I will um, arrange, arrange it to, to be uh, removed. Andrew, there's a question I want to ask. Uh, you've done excellent work. Uh, the video was excellent showing the displacement of the blood with heavy liquids and you could do a peripheral retinotomy and take out the blood and put a cryomark there. Just wondering that, do you feel that the addition of TPA submacular will help to uh, liquefy the clot and get the blood out easier? Because I like yeah. to put TPA in most of, nearly all my cases of submacular bleeds. Yeah, no, no, I agree with you. TPA is very useful. And now in, at, you know, at the eye hospital, I would say, I, I, I really probably do these drainage now, but I have got colleagues who use TPA all of the time. So even for very, very sm relatively small hemorrhages, which I would consider could be pneumatically displaced, two of my colleagues quite routinely are doing vitrectomies and subretinal TPA injection and, 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 and getting good results. Yeah, so I, agree. Certainly I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Atul, even I favor using uh, a TPA. Another question I had, so in the setting of a very fresh submacular hemorrhage, this works fine. But very often, especially in India, we get cases, you know, people who do not uh, come in early. So if you have organized that yellowish uh, you know, subretinal may not be submacular, maybe a little peripheral because sometimes you get peripheral PCB also. In such a situation, uh, how do you go by? Because it may not, these uh, these organized leathery clots that you see in PCB may not come out through a uh, retinotomy. So sometimes I have had to do peripheral retinectomies, a complete exactly. retinectomy. 
and then you know flip the retina over sometimes even you you're able to actually piece out the entire pcb complex with the leathery thing so have you gone in that far and in such situations would you put in again pfcl and visit the case again 5 to 7 days back or what i have done sometimes is put in oil yeah look and then you're absolutely right i mean once you start to remove blood you're often there um extending the retinotomy particularly if the if it's clotted um and so in that case you're right and then you would open it up and you treat it almost then like a giant retinal tear i still believe that heavy liquid has revolutionized management of these really complex cases because there's continued um pressure to to move the rest of the blood that might still be there you know that thin layer that you actually can't remove so over the next 3 4 days that blood will will come out and sit on the top of the heavy liquid for you to remove uh later on pvr obviously is what we're really worried about and so in 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 that sort of case um these are high risk i probably would then follow heavy liquid removal with an oil exchange um the other tip too is that if there is a large subretinal hemorrhage doing a b scan ultrasound can show you that perhaps you might have a layer within that within that detachment if it's hemoserous type of detachment and that they are more likely to drain sometimes again in these cases uh, present with massive uh, peripheral uh, hemorrhagic cds so in such a situation again would you favor pre treating them with steroids uh any role for steroids in your practice in these kind of situations very often they don't but sometimes they definitely do so would you think that steroids help or is it just something we just do as a matter of habit yeah look um, i think there are selected cases where steroids help um but but more to the case of if we're using heavy liquid and we're worried about a macrophagic response i will give some intravitreal dexamethasone or some intravitreal trimcillin at the first op to try to minimize the inflammation if i you know if i think they're a younger patient and they're more at risk of inflammation yeah i think oral steroids is going to help a lot for corridor detachment but no oh, i say uh, right yeah. so oral yeah. steroids yeah Yeah. yeah 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 but oral steroids are are yeah. useful not only to um potentially reduce corridor detachment but these patients are if they're massive they can they can be uncomfortable yeah. so um non steroidals and steroids can make a patient feel more comfortable you know at the very least yes and you know what a basic question sorry uh, patient you can go ahead no yeah. i just no i just just mentioned that i have I have two cases of a uh, submacular hemorrhage sweating for me at the moment in the OR you see so i just said to case, yeah my case should have gone back to bank <laughs> yeah. <off> you <laughs> well just seen two cases this morning well this is quite common. i have a, i have a basic question so what uh, size of a hemorrhage you would not consider surgery this is for professor atul as well as andrew chang or anybody here where you would consider still uh, your uh, standard ending wedge of treatment or pdt whatever so uh, i because these days we are becoming more and more bold with surgery probably going early so i think this is a basic question often asked and we face this dilemma uh, many a times well i think if the hemorrhage is a disc area or less I would be tempted not to do anything and just treat with an anti-vegf because and it depends where the blood is if the blood is principally under the RPE they can resolve very nicely with really good vision but if they dissect it through into the subretinal space that's when you've got an issue and um but you know my threshold perhaps for doing a intravitreal gas displacement is quite low I I I'm bit, you know but I I'm very very cautious about vitrectomy uh now but um but intravitreal gas injection I'm I'm quite comfortable with so if it's two disc areas um certainly I would I would try yeah just what I'm going to try after this symposium <laughs> two disc cases another point is if the blood is not very thick it's a very yeah. thin layer of blood yeah i agree thinly thin layer of blood they tend to resolve on their own so and, and only an anti vegf may be sufficient 
Yeah, I agree too. Uh, I see if, if we can if we can get the height on the OCT, which is about two millimeters, then I think anti VEGF uh, with TPA and rheumatic displacement uh, would work. I would even do it twice, you know, to uh, uh, this thing. So I, I would be hesitant to go in for vitrectomy early on. Also, anything within the arcades. That's generally my principle. Within the arcades, the height is within the OCT. I think uh, these do very well. I think uh, the point well taken by from Dr. Atul, TPA helps in liquefying that, and you can get more out of your gas injections. I would do even uh, repeat it twice uh, to you know push things out in case the first time the patient wasn't you know compliant with the prone position. That also is a is a is a matter. And very often these present as tense which is hemorrhages. So in that case, you're anyway going in. So in those situations, I think you'd modify your technique and then see whether you can get away with just doing uh, retinotomy and uh, uh, drainage or uh, whether you would need to, as we talked about, you know, extend to do a full-fledged uh, retinectomy. Another point that I'd just like to bring up is uh, when the, in the setting of these CDs, uh, about drainage of these uh, hemorrhagic choroidals, you know, I tend to fiddle around with the port or even make a, 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 a 25 gauge uh, port at the point where I think is the highest point of that hemorrhagic CD and then try to fiddle around and you know try to uh, get that uh, blood out as much as possible trans clearly. Uh, so that's just another thought that I put in. Uh, uh, one of our friends, Dr. Sangeet Mittal, there's something interesting. He puts in a cannula of the Venflon in and drains it out. So he's able to get out fluid from uh, far more posterior sites, and he, he finds that as being a very efficient way of uh, getting the blood out faster and in a better way. So your thoughts on the, the panel's thoughts? Yes, Dr. Andrew. Sorry, I just had, a, um, you know, I think they're all very good points you've just made, but look, I've just got a, I'd just like to ask your advice both to a tool or to you, Anand. When you do the TPA gas injection, do you do you know, a TPA injection, or if you're doing a vitrectomy and you want to give intravitreal TPA, do you give it preoperatively at all before you take them into the OR? Because I have had some, some of my colleagues will give a TPA injection in the anesthetic area as a, you know, intravitreally, and then they go into surgery later, you know, they're giving at least 15, 30 to 30 minutes potentially for some, some uh, you know, liquefaction of the clot. Yeah, I usually do it subretinally. If I'm going in for a massive uh, detachment, you know, with a 40 gauge, uh, uh, and then, you know, give it some time and then drain out. But uh, to doc, as Dr. Mangat was uh, asking, uh, talking about earlier, when you have a limited hemorrhage, then since I'm being non -in, trying to be as non-invasive, non-surgical as possible, then I would go in with the TPA gas and uh, anti-VEGF as uh, intravitreal injections. Mm. Dr. your uh, thoughts? Yeah, there are reports that you can give the TPA a few hours or even three or four days before to liquefy the clot and then do the surgery. So yeah, they inject yeah. the TPA three, four days prior to the procedure, actual procedures. By that time, the clot's liquefied. So the surgery shortened, the main surgery. But I find that intravital TPA, my, my personal experience is that it doesn't work so well. So I like to give subretinal TPA. 12.5 micrograms in 0.1 ml. Question I mean, here is, when you have even a smaller, like hemorrhagic PD and blood there, what is your primary mode of treatment? Would you like to give like injection like alfibrocept or you also consider in the presence of hemorrhage PDT? So that is the question here. So uh, what mode of therapy you would like to give uh, in, uh, as a primary primary treatment? I think I'll defer that. I'll ask um, Tim to answer that question. <laughs> Okay, sure. Um, and, yeah. You know, but, if uh, the yeah. blood is too thick, uh, obviously um, it might not be able to uh, visualize the uh, polypoidal lesions because uh, 
in order to do the PDT, we still have to do the ICG angiography. So if the blood is too thick, there's no point in doing uh, the ICG at that point. So I might just do some intravitreal uh, anti-VEGF injection first, wait for the blood subside a little bit, and then maybe one or two months later, repeat the ICG angiography to see if there are any polypodal lesions. Of course, uh, sometimes by that time, the OCT will show um, no disease activity. In that case, uh, we might probably just uh, continue with the anti-VEGF therapy uh, treat and extend kind of fashion without needing the PDT. Yeah, agree with him. Yeah, I think it's going to depend on the size of, of the bleeding and the thickness of the, the, the blood. And a question for Andrew, actually. Um, so uh, in some of the patients, uh, they are on anticoagulants and that's why they bleed a lot. So would you stop the warfarin or uh, pixaban uh, before the operation? Um, yeah, very good question. Um, a pixaban is a little, little bit hard to stop because it lasts for quite a long time. So the surgery might have to be deferred, you know, for over a week or so. Um, I always check the INR. Look, if the INR is within a therapeutic level, I, you know, two and a half to three, I, I'm okay with that to operate. So I think we've had a wonderful uh, session. Uh, I mean, I'd like uh, to thank all the speakers for the wonderful, you know, uh, uh, didactic talks. It's been a great session, a lot of learning to be had. I'd like to thank all the eminent panelists for their very insightful interactions. And um, uh, I'd like to thank uh, AOS and uh, APVRS for, you know, hosting this wonderful platform and for giving us the opportunity to be together today and to uh, bring out all these wonderful nuggets of information. And uh, I'd also like to thank Virtual MNC for putting up this very uh, uh, efficient platform and in such competence. And most of all, finally, to all the audience attendees who have logged in over various platforms uh, today. Thank you all so much. I would now like to invite my uh, chair of the session, Dr. Paisan, to you know close the session and give us a few words. Dr. Paisan. Oh, thank you. Well. Uh FURS would like to thank the AIOS for inviting us to join the symposium. Actually, we would like to join AIOS like, for many years now, but uh, this is a great opportunity that we are able to join. We hopefully, we are able to join in physical, maybe in the coming years. Yeah. So yeah, I, I agree with you. This is a, a wonderful session for a vivid discussion. And I think we learned a lot from this session. Thank you very much again for inviting us. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye, everybody. We close this session now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Demi, Andrew, and bye. Andrew, Anand, bye. And the dog one. Bye. And yeah, and the rest, everybody, and the audience. See you next time. Bye bye.